Uh, dream number 689. So I had one of those soothsaying dreams last night. It began on a street corner with a bunch of people I somehow knew. We were crossing a busy street. One of the guys was standing in a turn lane just before the median. Not safe. Another guy had made it halfway across the street and was standing safely in the median waiting for the traffic light to change. I was waiting to cross at the beginning. Seeing the guy standing in the turn lane, I yelled at him, you're not safe. He came back and joined me at the beginning. I remember thinking he should have gone to the median instead of coming back to me, but at least we were both safe for now. The light changed and as soon as we crossed the street, we entered a bridge. Yes, the familiar bridge of my dreams. It's a high bridge, sometimes swaying, sometimes still, sometimes open, sometimes encapsulated, but always, always a modern bridge. The bridge crossing is always a fun beginning. Excitement and joy, the start of a journey. But it never lasts. I walk with confidence at the start, but then I look down at the water below and see how far it is, and I'm scared. I look ahead and I see how far I have to go, and I'm scared. I'm scared of the long stretch of the bridge I know is ahead. There have been dreams, many dreams, where there is a drawbridge in the middle, and just as I get there, it's going up. And I get to the edge, and I see the other side of the bridge. That's been most of my dreams, the bridge dreams, that is. Not this time, nope. I was already at the end of the bridge. And from that point, I could see a damp landing just a few steps below me and I immediately leaped and left the others behind. Yep, yes siree, impulsive Terry. Yep, jumps without thinking. There's a group of young people waiting on this elevator. Guys in their 20s, I would say, wearing leather jackets and flip-flops. While waiting for the elevator, I see there's a window to the right. And I look out this window, and I can see that I'm at the end of the bridge. And it leads to these brick buildings, which remind me of the fascist buildings of the 20s and 30s. I'm puzzled, but nonetheless excited. I push the elevator button repeatedly but nothing happens. We've been waiting a long time, one of the youngsters says. I now realize that youngster was me. I run back up the steps to the bridge where I'd left the others. They've moved on. I run back down the steps to the elevator platform. Still no elevator. I push the button and I hear a mechanical sound which tells me the elevator has come. But the door won't open. I pull at it, I pull at it, but it just won't open. I keep pushing and it just creaks, it creaks and lets this light come through. I can see this light. But then it stands right back shut. Elevators never open in my dreams. They never have. I don't know why. I try to force it but it only opens slightly, like I said, then snaps back shut. The others behind me are laughing. We've tried it a dozen times, my younger self says. It won't open. Look out the window again, and I see the others that I had left behind are at the end of the bridge, the very end of the bridge. And in the lead of these people, there is a guy with a little baby. 
and he's at the very edge of the bridge. The guy with the baby's at the very edge of the bridge. However, the bridge is not complete. There is a gap. I follow the projective path of the bridge and I realize it will touch the ground, the shore, if there are more people on it. To weigh it down gently, it will connect. But there's something missing and I know that thing that is missing is me. I need to be out there on that bridge to give it enough weight so it gently goes down and connects with the other shore. I run back up the steps and find a passageway that leads back to the beginning. Find another passageway, as there is always in dreams. That passageway would take me back down the steps to the elevator. There is no other passages. I'm lost in dreamland. And I'm about to give up and just say, hey, I'm gonna go back to the beginning, big deal. But then I realize there's no going back at this point can't start over. And magically, another path kind of appears. It's dark, it's narrow, and when I get there, I realize it's a handicap ramp. But right to the side, I can squeeze by and I can get down, but I must turn sideways and maneuver carefully. And so I begin my descent to help the others the others that are me in different stages of my life. But then, no, 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 the dream is over. And I wake up. That's the end of dream number 689. In analyzing dream 689, I'll do it as I do with all my dreams, using my favorite dream dictionary written by Sandra A. Thompson, Cloud Nine. And I begin my analysis at the beginning of that main street we were all trying to cross. Obviously, this is the beginning of my life, my youth. The characters waiting to cross the street, I now realize, are me, the different faces in me at that time. The faces I had to wear to interact with the adults around me the other children, the teachers. I was always wearing faces. I was always afraid of me, showing me who I was. Because I never really knew who I was. I was told who I was. I wasn't like, I never looked in there and said, oh, I'm this. No, okay, you say I'm this, I'm this. You say I'm that, I'm this. You say I'm that, I'm that. You see, I was born in 1959 and came of age around 1967, six, eight, during the turbulent 60s. We lived in Detroit during what they called the race riots. But we now all know they were just another step in the long struggle for equality and justice in America that has been going on for so long. We lived in a white neighborhood at the time on the east side of the city first black family had just moved in and I became friends with the kid my age, Charlie. Charlie was funny, easygoing, and very giving. His whole family was. For the first time I walked in there, he said, hey Terry, you want something to eat? You want this? You want that? And they were intellectual too. They had books everywhere and they knew stuff about history and stuff about everything. Sports, you name it. I hadn't seen any other family around there, that Detroit blue collar, union, factory working people. And the world around Charlie and me was crazy, but we just ignored it. We played G.I. Joe and Hot Wheels, like boys do. One day playing on the steps of my porch, my grandfather came out and started calling Charlie, boy. He lowered his head. He was in shame. I lowered my head. I was in shame. We both crumbled inside. My grandfather was a racist, like most of the white people were that I knew back then. Charlie and I were both embarrassed. 
I crumbled inside because I knew it hurt Charlie. It was the first time I felt racism. Another time, Charlie and I were play wrestling in an open field down the street. We were imitating our favorite wrestlers. He was Bobo Brazil, the first black wrestler who broke all the color barriers in fake wrestling, big time wrestling, WWE World, E, whatever. Look him up, Bobo Brazil. And I was Lord Athol Layton. He was the Lord. He was a British guy. I looked up to him. Well, Charlie and I were wrestling. I was just about to put him in the headlock. I was a little bit bigger than Charlie. So I looked like I was probably dominating. But we were faking it, you know. Boom, he get his balls, I get mine. And at this time, while we were fighting, I felt this kick in my back. It just knocked me down, and it was hard. It was a black teenager who saw us fighting, and he came to help Charlie. He kicked me twice before Charlie announced to him, hey, we're friends, stop it. A few weeks later, the city violence got worse. We could see the smoke from downtown over the buildings city was on fire, on blaze. The National Guard came with their jeeps, soldiers with their rifles, and even a tank. We were that close to the action, I guess. And Charlie and I could only play till 6 o'clock because that was curfew. Then we had to go home. It was summertime. It didn't get dark to 8. You know, for 8, 9-year-old kid who was allowed to play till the streetlights came on, that was... That was just, hey, wait, what are you doing? What are we doing? Why, why, why are you picking on us, right? It was my intro to life. And my dream hesitation in crossing the street at the beginning of Dream 689. What's funny that I couldn't cross that street without the help of that black man coming back to cross with me. I'm not sure what that means. I haven't been the best at supporting minorities. You know, I've been white privileged. I mean, I'm, I'm not like rich. I'm very poor actually. And I never really was aggressive to look for money. But, um, you know, I always kind of blushed. I felt bad inside whenever I was around a group of white people and they were especially saying, making fun of Jews because my dad was a Jew. Anyway, that's neither here or there. But so I got on the bridge of life and began my journey. That's how the dream went. Consulting my dream dictionary, a bridge can unite the past with the present. Okay? I get that. I really do. And I'm certain that that is the part of this whole dream, was my life, the whole life. But I think a bigger part of Dream 689 is the crossing of the bridge itself. Thompson says in her book, and I quote, In many myths, crossing a bridge represents the passage from life to death and into whatever is your conception of life or the great beyond. This or other crossings would be typical in a dream of someone who is terminally ill or close to death. Ouch. Reading that was scary. And to be honest, I wanted to avoid it. But avoiding dreams creates nightmares. So I read it, and I wrote it, and I'm reciting it here to you. As many of you know, I'm still recovering from having had lung cancer. So I'm definitely closer to the beyond than I am the beginning. As I have documented in my blog, my Buddhist faith has bought me some time. I don't know how much, I don't know how long, but I know I got more time than I had before I sat down there and started chanting. Therefore, I must now tell you that I am a follower of Nietzschean Buddhism. 
And we chant Nam Mi Ho Renge Kyo for peace and happiness. I joined the Soka Gekai two years ago. And I chanted Nam Mi Ho Renge Kyo and my life changed. But from the first time I chanted, the first time I chanted, I was sore on my right chest. And it got sore and sore. And I figured, wow, I haven't chanted my whole life. And, you know, I prayed a little bit, but, I, you know, we didn't sit there and pray like this, like they do, we do when we chant. And so it just must be some conditioning, a conditioning issue. It was a conditioning issue, but it wasn't a conditioning issue of the muscle. It was a conditioning issue of my faith, of my life, of my whole being. Pain, while chanting, never went away. It got a little bit worse and worse, but it really wasn't a pain either. And I've seen that when I saw the doctors, they were kind of like, no, that little cancer cell in your lung was not creating any pain. So they just think I was very lucky that I went in there as soon as I did. And they found it in the early stages because it never did go away. And it was an early enough detection to where they could remove part of the lung that had the cancer in it. And today, thanks to Channing, I am a cancer survivor. I truly believe that Channing saved my life, gave me more time. Since having the cancer's part of my lung removed, my chest doesn't hurt anymore when I champ. And so I am the first in my family in a long line of people who died of cancer at a younger age, and they should have. I'm the first one who's changed this family karma and got more time. Living a natural life is what it means. I mean, you, you're not going to chant and just live forever or anything, but you will chant for happiness and you will live your natural life. But our karma, the things we do, will shorten our life. Could shorten our life, I should say. But by chanting, and we believe we're changing our karma here today, not in the next life, I have changed my karma. And I have more time, and therefore, I'm analyzing my dream with you and sharing my Buddhist faith with you. And by chanting, you will experience the happiness I have, and maybe you will be interpreting one of your dreams too. Which brings me back to my dream, finally. Back to the dream. I see now that that elevator door in my dream was death, is death. That light behind there. And that elevator door opens and I enter it. I'm on the other side. And, you know, I'll be talking to you from there too, I'm sure, but just in a different realm. But the elevator door hasn't opened. And that bridge of life that used to have rise in the middle as I was trying to earn a living and all that, came down and I got across, got up again, came down. And over the years, there's just been crazy dreams about a bridge. I mean, that's been my life path along that bridge. So I'm in the last, I don't know, fourth or third, maybe the last third, that'd be great. That'd be another 20, 30 years, I'd love that. But I'm not expecting it or praying for it or whatever. I'm content with whatever life brings me. But I do want to tell you that I'm here. My karma has changed to chanting Nam Mi Ho Renge Kyo. And I definitely advise you to check it out. That's dream number 689.